I'm really excited this afternoon about our keynote speaker. CJ Calvert is a motivational speaker and author of Living an Exceptional Life. He is the president of Calvert Training, the motivational arm of Chappell FGI. CJ speaks on a daily basis to world-class organizations like IBM, Royal Bank, and Ford. Because of his expertise, he's been featured on Breakfast Television, ET Edmonton, and Daytime. He is the most requested corporate speaker in Canada, delivering over 300 presentations a year. He lives in Toronto with his wife and son. Please join me in welcoming CJ Calvert. Hey, Charmaine. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. How are you doing today? Right, how many guys do we have in the audience anyway? Like three. Best ratio you've had since university. It doesn't get any better. Well, guys, it's a real pleasure being with you as Charmaine has very graciously introduced me. My name is CJ Calvert. And can we give Charmaine a round of applause for that tremendous introduction? She looked very confident, but I know that uh, she wanted to do a very good job and she had some butterflies in her tummy. I thought you did a great job, so thank you, Charmaine. So I've been invited to uh, kick off the Administrative Professionals Conference with a talk on managing change with a positive attitude. Just out of curiosity, to show of hands here, honestly, how many of you have ever uh, been through times of change? Oh, a couple of hands, all right, fantastic. How many of you have ever been in a situation where two people were in the same exact situation and they had totally different responses? One person was totally calm, the other person's freaking out. How many of you have ever had that happen? Fantastic. You know, it's interesting that we see this all the time. And if you take two people, put them in the same situation, and one person's freaking out, if you interview them after and say, well, what was it? Why were you overwhelmed? They'll blame the situation. They'll say, well, I couldn't handle it. It was, it was just too big, it was overwhelming. And yet the person beside them manages the stress, manages the change just fine. It's interesting, my wife and I were actually stuck in the elevator in our condominium a couple of years ago. So it was Shannon, myself, third lady, three of us in the elevator, and the elevator got stuck in between a couple of different floors, literally stuck, like the doors are slamming shut. You can see the concrete divider, like one floor, one floor, it's banging shut, jamming up and down, trying to get unstuck. And this is happening for a couple of minutes. Finally, my wife, just frustrated, says, this is ridiculous. Give me your cell phone. I want to phone the building office to tell them to reset the elevator. Come on, we got to go. This is her personality, very driving, fantastic. I just love her. I have a different personality. I'm looking at the escape hatch of the roof thinking, Mission Impossible. <laughs> this is my chance. I can hear the theme music. You know, doom, doom, doom. I'm going to climb out of here. I just thought it was funny. Well, the lady beside me did not find that funny because the lady beside me had claustrophobia. So what do you think her response is to being stuck in the elevator with the door slamming and jammed between two floors? Well, her response was panic. It was... <gasps> Like she's just freaking out. And I realize this, I'm trying to be compassionate. So I just do my part to help. I do this. What was that? <laughs> just trying to drum up some business for my Overcome Your Fear seminar. There's my guard. But the crazy thing is, all three of us are in the exact same situation. We're in the exact elevator. My wife is feeling frustrated. I just think it's funny. And the lady beside me perceives a mortal threat. You understand, being stuck in a situation doesn't make you feel overwhelmed. It doesn't make you feel scared. It does not make you feel stressed. What you personally think about being stuck in the situation is what causes these reactions. Does everyone understand that? It's not the situation, guys. I mean, my goodness, I travel across Canada speaking to world-class organizations, and you know, I hop on, I love WestJet, by the way. Anyone out from the West? Anyone in Alberta, Saskatchewan? Just fantastic, I just love WestJet, because they're funny. They're funny, they're not stuck up, they're funny. You know, they say, they get on, they do the, the, the shtick, and they say, hey, anyone caught smoking on the airplane is gonna be asked to leave immediately. <laughs> you know, I just love them. <laughs> And so I like WestJet, but I'm sitting there and, and I fly enough that I've got my magazines and my stuff and I'm watching the movie and relaxing. And I got a guy beside me who's just white knuckling the armrest. You ever fly? How many of you know somebody just terrified of flying? So this guy's just, just praying to land safely. So this is like an invitation for me <laughs> to have some fun. I'm like, 
did you hear that? Was, was that a bolt? Or, or if I get the window seat, I'm like, do you feel air? Come, is this on tight enough? There's my card. <laughs> you know, you can't go through life too, you know, nervous and, you know, you gotta relax, you gotta have some fun. But here's my point. Every one of us is gonna face situations that are tough. Every one of us is gonna go through tough times. Do you believe this? You know, it doesn't matter if you're a Hollywood movie star, multimillionaire, every one of us faces tragedy. Every one of us is gonna face good times and bad times. I don't know all of your names, I don't know all of your stories. I have the pleasure of uh, saying hi and meeting some of you out in the hallway, and I hope to meet some more of you as the day goes on. But the thing is that I don't, without even knowing your names, I already know every one of us, including me, is going to face tragedy. We're all gonna have good days, we're all gonna have bad days. Everyone understand that? We're gonna have good years and bad years, and that is the cycle of life. I mean, I have seen companies that I've walked into with sales targets, eight figure, nine figure sales targets on the wall, plaqued on the wall, and I walk in to deliver this talk, and they are all being let go. I'm like the bad news guy for the last 18 months, traveling across Canada, like four or 500 people in the audience, and the next day, pink slips, they're gone. And my message to these audiences is to understand, no matter how bad it looks today, whatever we're going through today, it always turns around. We've all gone through enough life experience to understand this is the way the game works. I mean, it's like we're passing through the seasons. We go through fall, we go through the harvest, then we face a winter, but eventually the spring and the summer come. It's like a roller coaster, guys, this game of life that we go up, we go down. We have a good day, we have a bad day, we have a good year, we have a bad year. And we have to, when we're at the bottom part of the cycle, we have to have the patience and the faith to understand it will turn around. Do you get that? You just have enough faith as it's going through the tough times, it can't stay bad. This too shall pass. And eventually, it's gonna start to go up. By the way, if you're having a good day, give it time. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> right back down. That is the way it goes. And so, one of my favorite authors and speakers is a guy named Jim Harris, and he speaks on leadership and managing change. In fact, Jim was actually, a few years ago, the leader of the Federal Green Party, if you, if you knew about that at that time. That's who he was and what he was doing. But he shared a wonderful analogy talking with me when I was back in sales, talking with my sales team. A wonderful story of an ancient Chinese farmer. And this ancient Chinese farmer was renowned throughout the land as being a very wise, calm, just an incredibly calm, wise guy. Whatever situation he faced, he could handle the change. He was also renowned for being very wealthy. He had a horse, he was able to till the land much more efficiently, generate more revenue. Well, one day, his horse breaks out of the corral, disappears into the fields, seemingly never to be seen again. And all the villagers, all the friends and family gather around this farmer, just heartbroken, grief-stricken for this man, and says, oh my goodness, your only horse, your source of wealth, how filled with sorrow and despair you must be. Well, the wise farmer, very calm, just simply says, well, we'll see. Well, a couple days goes by, and the horse comes back. But in its journeys through the fields, it has befriended two other wild horses. They come back with it. And everyone's like, wow, this is great! Your wealth is tripled overnight, you must be so overjoyed, just filled with happiness. The wise farmer just kind of shrugs calmly and says, well, we'll see. Well, a couple days goes by and the farmer has a teenage son. And as teenage boys are known to be a little bit foolhardy and rambunctious, this teenage boy gets on the back of the wild horse trying to ride it, and the wild horse kicks him off, throws him to the ground, shattering his leg. And while a broken leg today is no big deal, Thousand years ago, it might have been a life-threatening ailment. So once again, all the villagers, all the family gather around this poor guy and say, Oh my gosh, your son with a broken leg, how filled with sadness and hopelessness you must be. And the wise farmer again calmly says, Well, we'll see. Well, later that week, the Chinese army comes sweeping through the countryside, conscripting all of the young men to go to war, all except... The kid with the broken leg, he couldn't go. And everyone's, whoa, this is great. Your son is spared from the ravages of war. How relieved and overjoyed you must be. And once again, the wise farmer shrugs and says, we'll see. You see, guys, we don't always get to choose what happens to us. We could be doing everything right in life. We go through a red, a green light, boom, somebody runs the red, we have an accident. We didn't have any control over that. 
Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. It's the way it works. But you know, there is one thing we have absolute control over no matter what curveball life throws us, no matter what change we're facing, there is always one thing we have absolute control over in every situation. What is the one thing we get to choose? What do you think? Shout it out. Your reaction, your attitude. Exactly, we get to choose our attitude. We get to choose our reaction. And so I want to play a fun little game with you guys right now just to kind of get a sense of your reaction to change. Now, hopefully you brought a pen and a piece of paper. You thought, well, maybe this, aside from the nice food, the guy might say something worth writing. You know, that's my hope. You thought it might happen. So why don't you go ahead and drag out your pen and your piece of paper. We're going to play a fun little game here. Quick, simple, easy little game. And what I'd like you to do with this fun little game is I'd like you to write your first and last name down three times. Write your first name and your last name down three times. Go ahead and do that. Take a moment and do that. Some people still going for paper. All right. Well, hopefully some of you have got your names written down at this point, okay? Now, it's a pretty simple exercise. You've probably practiced this a couple of times. We would hope. All right, now here's the curveball. I'd like you to do it again. I'd like, again, a second time, I'd like you to write your first and last name down again three times. Oh, but this time, switch hands. How many of you knew that was coming? Uh, you know it was coming. All right, go ahead and do it with your other hand. So for most of us, we're right-handed. Do it with your left hand. Do it with your less dominant hand. Got some laughter, some grumbling. Oh my goodness! Looks like my kid's handwriting. It's getting worse. No point in looking at each other's handwriting. It's not a quiz. You can't copy the answer or anything. These two are looking at each other. Some of you are like, wow, it's actually getting better. There you go. So here's where we find out who's got the really long names. All right, looks like some people are getting this finished off. Okay, keep going if you haven't finished, keep going. But let me ask you this, this is the opportunity for audience participation. I'm gonna get you to shout out one word answers. How did that make you feel the second time? People might shout out like frustrated. How did that make you feel? Funny, awkward, inadequate, silly, challenge, slowing down. Fun, that's a good answer. Now, just very quickly, show of hands. Put up your hand if you found the second time took longer. Okay, right across the board, right? Of course, put up your hand if you found the quality went down, if it was messier the second time. Across the board. Please understand this. Every time you do something new, you face a learning curve. And it always invites delays, and it always invites mistakes you're always going to slow down and you're always going to fumble and futz it up the first couple of times because you're just learning. That's, com that's just common sense. Everyone understands that. Now let's apply that to your job. And the person mandating the new software, the new procedure, the new... By the way, I don't mind if anyone's phone goes off. All I ask is that you have a cool ringtone. <laughs> Lady Gaga, Flo Rock, something cool, you know, that I can dance badly to here on stage, you know, something cool, you know, please, at least a cool ring to it. Anyway, but um, anytime you are mandated to do something new, which can also mean reporting to a boss with a different personality, different operating style, managerial style, that is a new situation going, oh, you are popular, whoever that is. <laughs> wow, they're like, hey, is there still room in the event? I heard this guy's awesome and I want to join. <laughs> That's cool, I know. But um, anyway, so, it always invites delay, it always invites mistakes. Now, we feel 
a sense of job security in our role when we can execute our tasks on time and accurately. And whenever we face a learning curve, it always is a direct assault on our sense of security, of job mastery. Does that make sense? Because it slows us down, we invariably make mistakes. And now the person who signs our paycheck, who grades our performance, is the one mandating that we use this new procedure, this new piece of software, this new thing. And that is a real challenge for employees. But let me ask you, at what point should we stop learning? At what point should we stop adopting new technology, new procedures, improving ourselves? I mean, thank goodness we had a situation at home literally two years ago where my wife almost died in my arms. Crazy, crazy situation. Very, very upsetting. And thank goodness when we rushed to the ER that these nurses and doctors in the emergency room were up to date on the latest technology, up to date on the latest procedures. Because what year should ER professionals stop learning? 1850, ah, we got enough down. No, never, right? Can you imagine? But I want you to think about this. Imagine, imagine being an ER nurse. The stakes couldn't be higher. You have a human life on the line. The pressure couldn't be more intense. Sometimes you literally have seconds or minutes to save a life. What do you think happens when management comes to the hospital and says, hey, we've got this new gidgety gadget we'd like you to learn? Do you think it might cross the mind of the ER professionals, not to say they're gonna do this, but it might cross their mind to say, I already know how to do this technique perfectly. I'm not gonna slow down to mess it up. I already know how to do it. I know how to save lives doing it the old way. You think maybe in the back of your mind they might think, this is just a phase. Management's rolling out this thing. This will blow over in six months. I'll just quietly <laughs> continue doing it the old way. And then management, when they come to their senses, six months will say, whoops, and then I didn't have to change. You think maybe that might cross their mind that they'll just do it the old way and save a life? But thank goodness they don't do that. Thank goodness they force themselves through the discomfort of a learning curve. Thank goodness. Now, you know what's interesting? You know who's really good at managing change? Kids. Kids are really good at managing change, contrasted to adults. I had the opportunity to work with uh, Sunnybrook Hospital, merging with Women's College here in Toronto two years ago as they're merging. And I'm going in talking, delivering this talk to all of the nurses, and it was not surprising to me that the nurses who had worked at Women's College for 30 years were having a much harder time with the thought of picking up and moving over to Sunnybrook much harder time than the nurses who had been working there for 30 days. Does that surprise anybody? Not at all. Not at all. Same with kids, guys. You realize kids are much more adept at managing changing situations, much more adept than adults. And the reason, as soon as I say it, is obvious. The reason is we, as adults, get a picture in our mind of the way we think the world is supposed to be. This is our expectation. And when reality doesn't line up with our expectation, we feel disappointed and frustrated and paralyzed. But a kid, they don't have any expectations. They don't have a sense of history. They don't think this is how things should be. So whatever happens, that's well, okay, fine. And we can learn a lot of lessons from kids. My wife and I, we got a beautiful little guy at home, three years old, great, and he's awesome. How many of you are parents? How many of you have a little one at home? Some of the little ones have grown up. How many have got the little ones grown up? Left the house? How many have got 40-year-olds living at home? <laughs> Stop cooking with cheese. Seriously. Like, if, if it's now, you know, okay, you're, you're 41. It's like, lavalife.com. Let's move on. <laughs> but our little guy is three. He's totally awesome. He's been, I mean, everyone thinks they're, they're the little guys, great, right? But for us... It's not subjective. It's an empirical fact. <laughs> that he's fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, you know, obviously I'm biased. But here's the great thing. I get, you know the great thing? I told my wife, I said, sweetheart, oh, three mics. I said, sweetheart, I said, whether it's a boy or a girl, I'm equally happy. But secretly, I can tell you guys now, I was actually rooting for a boy. I was like secretly in my heart, wishing, hoping to have a little boy. Because now, I can shop at Toys R Us guilt-free. <laughs> The Star Wars Legos for Brayden. So I'm gonna help put it together. It's not for me. <laughs> anyway, I know, I'm sure in the next couple years he's gonna say, hey, mom, dad, can I have a video game? Can I have a PlayStation or a Nintendo or whatever, the Xbox? Can I have one of these things? And so I'm sure this conversation is gonna come up. Now imagine 
a little nine-year-old boy on his ninth birthday gets this video game, gets an Xbox or a PlayStation. Do you think the little nine-year-old boy gently, methodically opens the box and, you know, reads the manufacturer warranty and safety procedures, return policy? You think he really goes through those details? Or you think he rips the box open and plugs it in and dives into the game? How do you think he rips the box open? Jumps right in the game. Absolutely. And as the child goes into the game, the child does not know what's going to happen. It's a surprise, right? A bad guy jumps out from around the corner, bonks him on the head, three strikes, you're out. But something fascinating happens. The young boy now learns, okay, behind that door is a bad guy. So he changes his strategy, goes back into the game, remembers behind the door is a bad guy. He, he uh, preemptively knocks the guy in the head and gets past level one onto level two. This is how the game is played, right? And as the game progresses, do the challenges get easier or do the challenges get harder? They get harder. Bigger bad guys, faster bad guys, more bad guys. And so, the skills that made the little boy good enough to pass from level 1 to level 2 are not going to be sufficient for the little guy to get to level 10. Does that make sense? He's going to have to improve his skills. Understand this. Nothing fails like success. Nothing fails like success. I see it all the time. My background sales, so we'd get a good salesperson, top performing salesperson. And think about it, this is across every industry. You get a top performer, and management says, oh, they're such a great salesman. I know what we should do. We should take them away from sales and have them manage other salespeople. Do you understand those are two completely unrelated skill sets? It's like this teacher is the best teacher. We should take them out of the classroom so that they don't spend any time on what they're good at and have them manage kids or have them manage the, well, <laughs> sometimes you can't tell, have them manage the teachers. But the thing is, we start getting promotions when we're good until we're not good enough to get the next promotion. My wife is the director of recruiting for a company that hires 15,000 people a year. A year, that is a lot of hiring. And her new role is talent management and succession planning, career planning. And she's literally going through interviewing every single person, having teams of people get together, doing all this talent management stuff to figure out whether this person's promotable, whether they can be trained, whether they should be on the fast track with an MBA, whether they should be let go. And it's interesting that people get promoted. This is her statement. People get promoted to their level of incompetence. If you're really good at the job, you get promoted until you're not good enough to get to the next job. And then you just sit there, not being good. I'm like, wow, that's not very good. So she's going through the whole company, culling people who've reached the point where they're not good enough to get to the next level because they're unwilling to change. They're unwilling to learn and grow. They're being invited to not arrive at work anymore. <laughs> Ever again. <laughs> it's been a pleasure knowing you. <laughs> Never come back. <laughs> You know, and so this is what she's going through. And so imagine a little 10 year old boy as he's going through these different levels, he has to improve. And I gotta tell you, as a brand new dad, three years of experience, my little guy is one of the best little guys in the world at greeting me when either one of us go to daycare and pick him up. I mean, I get down on my hands and knees and he says, oh, daddy, and he spots me, he just runs like a beeline to me and leaps in my arms in a big hug, he's so excited. And all the other parents and the teachers are like, wow, he's awesome. You, you must be such a great dad. He obviously loves you so much. You must be a great dad. And I, you know, I thank them very much for that, and I say that's great. So because I give them, I'm like, don't no, come to daddy, come to daddy, and just runs in my arms, okay? And I say, wow, you're such a great dad for doing that, okay? So he's three. Let's fast forward to 12. <laughs> Picture grade eight as I'm picking him up. <laughs> come to daddy. <laughs> he's gonna say, <clears throat> I don't know that guy. <laughs> uh, Dad, can, can we pretend we've never met? Can you just hide in the bushes <laughs> out of sight? Seriously, how horrifyingly embarrassing would it be for him for me to do that, right? But I want you to think about it. I'm doing the exact same behavior that made me successful when he was three. And if I continue doing the exact same thing that made me successful 10 years later, the exact behavior will now make me a failure. Doesn't it make sense? Yeah. Just because it worked today, just because it worked five years ago, 
It might not only be the wrong thing to do, it might literally be holding you back from promotion. And so what we have to do is look at a child going through a video game and see maybe we can cull some lessons that we can apply to our life. Because as soon as the little guy finishes the video game, now he knows all the secrets. Now he knows where all the bad guys jump out. He's beaten all the puzzles. He's mastered the game. He can fly through the video game effortlessly. Is the game still fun? Is the game still interesting to the little boy? No, the game is boring because he knows everything. What does the little guy want? What does he want to buy? He wants a brand new game. He wants to be challenged. He wants to face new puzzles. He wants to face new uh, bad guys popping up. He wants to learn. He wants to change. He wants to face uncertainty. You know what adults don't like doing? Learning, changing, accepting uncertainty. We don't want to do that. We want to know, no, everything's going to be exactly the same. Next Friday, my paycheck will be in the bank account. I don't have to learn it. It's going to be exactly the same. We like the feeling, the warm, fuzzy blanket of the status quo. We have no control over the fact the world will change around us whether we like it or not. Everyone get that? Yeah. And so what do we need to do? We need to say, how can I play this game? You realize what's going to make you competitive is how fast you can learn. I'm being coached right now by a guy 42 years old who makes $35,000 a week. $35,000 a week. 42 years old. Uh, two weeks ago was his 11th year of being utterly rich, retired millionaire. And you know why? I asked him, how do you make, how do you do this? And he says, CJ, how many books, this is last year, how many books do you read on self-development, professional development, leadership, business, the whole business, how many books, not Daniel Steele romance novels, how many business, personal development books do you read a year? And I said, I read a book a month, and I've been reading a book a month since I was 19 years old. I've got literally hundreds and hundreds of books in my library, in my home. He says, CJ, that's the difference. I read a book every three days. Every three days. Now he's retired. So he's got a little more time, so he can tear through 1,500 pages a day. But he says, I was doing that when I had a job because I knew the only competitive advantage is for me to outlearn the competition. It's not who masters the software the best today. It's who, when the new software comes out, you don't grumble and futz around and fight back and are bitter about it. You, you literally shuck the old software and you become very excited about the new software and you learn it before everyone else. And then when the software, the new stuff comes out after that, you get rid of the old stuff, you learn the new stuff. It's how fast you can learn. That is your competitive advantage because the world is going to change. And so you've all written your name down, you wrote it down, you realize, oh, you know, it kind of slowed down. And there's no real consequence to playing the little game we just played. It's just writing your name down. Well, imagine you had a car accident. Imagine you're in a car accident. And the, uh, you know, the car accident, you come out of it, and now you've got your hand in a cast for six weeks. Now how do you feel? Take the 30 seconds of awkwardness and frustration that you just felt and magnify that over six weeks. So six weeks of awkwardness, six weeks of frustration and inconvenience. But everybody knows at the end of it, oh, the cast comes off, it's just a broken arm, just a broken bone, it'll heal, right? What if you have a car accident, you wake up, and to your horror, your arm has been amputated from the elbow down. You've lost your hand, your dominant hand. Now how do you feel? Let's take all of those emotions and magnify them over decades. Oh, but let's add to the list shock and denial. This cannot possibly be happening. This is a horrible nightmare. I'm going to wake up from this. Let's add anger and bitterness and rage at the other driver for doing this. Let's add survivor's guilt that you only lost your hand, but somebody else lost their life. Let's add bargaining with the universe. I promise I'll be a better person. I'll do anything. Just give me my hand back. And then depression and grief and a sense of loss. All of the things you'll no longer ever be able to do because you lost your dominant hand. Guys, I play the piano. I write symphony music for fun. I went to university to learn how to score Hollywood movies. They actually, you know, the action music in movies? That's what I went to school for. So I write books. I write music. I rock climb. If I lost my hands, I mean, it'd be debilitating for anybody, but I can tell you right now, it would really hurt me to lose my dominant hand. Like it would have a massive impact, as it would for anyone. But what do we hope happens emotionally, psychologically? What do we hope happens for somebody who's going through this journey? What do we hope happens for them? Given enough, enough time, what point do we hope they reach? What do we hope they feel? What do you think? Acceptance. Acceptance. 
We hope for them as quickly as possible that they can reach a point of acceptance, that they are at peace with the fact this is the way it is. And that it's interesting, speed of adaptation drives speed of acceptance. That's another good point you may want to write down. Speed of adaptation drives speed of acceptance. Because you understand, the person is so consumed with loss and grief and anger at everything that's gone, if you can quickly show them, hey, listen, you can learn to type with your left hand, you can learn to do this stuff with your left hand, if you can help them adapt, you can show them, hey, it's not going to be 100%, but maybe 90%, you can get most of the functionality back, they'll start to feel at peace. Does that make sense? Speed of adaptation drives speed of acceptance. So we have to move through this as quickly as possible. This was laid out brilliantly in a wonderful book by a guy named William Bridges, wrote a great book called Transitions. And so I don't, does anyone, if you have anyone that you're a supervisor, is anyone that has direct reports in the room? Okay, so if you've got direct reports, not only transitions, but the follow-up for managers managing transitions. These books, by the way, are all on my website. In fact, you know what, while you've got your pens, you may as well write my website down right now. So it's simply my name. So it's www.cjcalvert.com, same as on the book. And uh, interesting, does anyone like motivational quotes, positive quote of the day kind of stuff? How many of you like that sort of stuff? Go to my website, everything we're talking about today, all the books I reference are all on the website, tons of articles and resources, but if you like motivational quotes as well, you can put your name, email, right in the right hand corner, hit send, and every day I'm gonna have you sent a positive motivational quote of the day, just my gift to you for uh, coming and visiting the website. So I hope you enjoy that. But transitions and managing transitions, those books, there's an Amazon portal on my book, on my uh, bookstore in my website, you can get these books, and they're the best books I've ever read on guiding teams through times of change. They're absolutely fantastic. And what William Bridges says is there's three distinct stages psychologically that we all go through in times of change. The first stage is the ending. That's where the old situation ends. And you can literally write it on a calendar. This is the day the change happened. This is when things ended. The day we had the car accident, the day the house burned down, or good stuff. This is the day that we got married. This is the day we had the baby. This is the day we moved into the new house, because change doesn't have to be bad. This is the day, and we can look on the calendar and we can see pretty easily that's the day it happened. The mistake that organizations make is that they think that that day is the change. They think, okay, if I pick people up and move them to the new office and get them set up on the new software, that the change is done. No, no, that's just the beginning of the change. The ending, that's just the starting point because what happens next is called the neutral zone. The neutral zone can last days, weeks, months, sometimes years, and the neutral zone is every day after the change that you are still upset about it. Because think about it, you wake up in the hospital, you've lost your hand, well that's instantaneous. You can see the day on the calendar I lost my hand. It's every day after the change that you're still angry and bitter and grieving that you're in the neutral zone. And it's totally different based on every situation for every different person. Do you guys understand that? Everyone reacts totally differently. And so what we want to do is recognize that almost always there is no intrinsic value in being in the neutral zone. It's totally normal to be in the neutral zone. It's absolutely normal to be sad. It's absolutely normal to be upset. There's just no point in being sad and upset in almost all situations. I mean, I go into so many companies that there's been a merger and an acquisition. A big company buys a little company. And then I come back a year later and the staff who get bought are so angry about it. Then I come back a year later to do another talk and the staff who were angry last year are still angry. Do you understand the futility of that? I look at them, I'm like, you've been bought. You are just ruining every day of your life. Does that make sense? You can be angry all day long. It doesn't change the fact you've been bought. How many understand what I'm talking about? It doesn't change anything to feel these emotions. In very rare circumstances, is there any point that there would be such a horrific event that there would be a point in grieving? Very few circumstances. There are some, but very few. Most of the time, guys, when life throws a little tiny curveball, we face little tiny stuff, we're just overreacting. We're just taking something small and blowing it absolutely out of proportion. How many of you believe that most people take little tiny things, 
blow them right out of proportion. Oh my goodness, you need only spend a couple of weeks in a third world country doing missionary work to realize that people in any major city blow things out of proportion. I mean, my goodness, I had the incredible blessing and opportunity. This would have been 2004, so seven years ago or so. I got to go with a group of 25 missionaries down to Nicaragua, part of a wonderful charity called Operation Christmas Child. I don't know if anyone's seen this or heard this. You take shoe boxes, you put toys in the shoe box, wrap it up. How many have seen this with the toys? Oh, wow, you guys are amazing. So my sales team and I did this for years. I mean, we would like have an assembly line of high school students that uh, were getting credits for school, volunteer credits, and just filling the stuff up, pack and send them off. One of the people on my sales team went to Nicaragua 2003, took a bunch of photos, amazing experience, comes back. I was so inspired by her example that I just said, I'm coming next year. So I got on the plane, went, it was an incredible experience, guys. Two weeks there, hand building a school, back breaking labor in this third world country. And people say, hey, CJ, did that change your life going? And I said, you know, interestingly, it actually didn't change my life because I felt I was already pretty grateful. I felt I already realized I was pretty lucky. You know what was shocking to me, though, was when I got back. And I got back to Toronto, and it was like a spotlight was shining on how everybody in Toronto whines and complains about little tiny things. I mean, you need only see human nature in action at the local grocery store in the eight item express line. Stand in line. When someone in line in front of you has made the grievous moral error of having nine items in the eight item line. I mean, I had two little old ladies in front of me, like they're you know, three feet tall, 180 years old, blue hair, little canes, whacking at each other. And one of them had nine items, and they were so rude to each other. One of them says to the other, did you miss the day in grade one? Where they covered the difference between the number eight and the number nine. Did you miss that day? I'm like, lady, I had to separate them. Back. It's like going to be an MMA UFC smackdown right there. And I'm standing in line the next week at McDonald's. And some guys in the morning, some guy hasn't had breakfast. His dream in line at McDonald's is to have an egg McMuffin. I mean, it is the single point of light in all of the darkness of the tortured, suffering, or experience of his morning. It's the only thing carrying him through the thought of a tantalizing, delectable, succulent, nutritious McMuffin. Those flavors exploding across his palate, just nurturing and nourishing his soul. Now with 10% real egg. He can't wait. He's so excited to have a McMuffin. And as he finally gets his turn to step up and order the McMuffin, the clock goes click, 10.35. <laughs> Breakfast is done. He was so angry, you could see steam coming off his head. You could cook an egg on his head. I mean, I backed away. In case the guy's packing heat, I didn't want to get you know, gunned down. You know, motivational author, gunned down by McMuffin guy. <laughs> That's not a good headline. But it is unbelievable to me how people take little tiny things and they blow them absolutely out of proportion. I mean, I'm, even I'm not immune to this. I mean, sometimes I get cranky and bent out of shape. Not usually, but sometimes. We actually... I, I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. I have a guilty pleasure, so I'm going to admit my guilty pleasure. My wife and I, I don't watch a lot of TV. There's one show I like, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit it. I like watching American Idol. Anyone else watch American Idol? I just, you know what, because I don't watch a lot of these reality shows, because they're not reality shows. Most of them are not reality shows. But this show, you know why I like it? I like it because it's like 300,000 people line up in the rain. They don't have a prayer of making it. They're going to get told no, but they stand all day in the rain. And then maybe they get a chance to get in front of the judges for the opportunity to be humiliated on national television. <laughs> they don't have a prayer of making it then. And then maybe they're good enough to get to Hollywood Week where they're going on 90 minutes of sleep, having nervous breakdowns, these people just stressed out of their mind. Maybe they get the chance, only week after week, having a dream ripped out of their hands until one man's left standing, one girl's left standing. But you know why I love it? The guts. Just the guts to try, the guts to go after your dreams and take a swing for the fences and say, I'm going to go for it. I believe in myself. And then they go from being a waitress or a mechanic to Grammy Award winning singer. Like, I love that. I love the, the initiative and the bravado and the guts and the rags to riches. So I like the show. Anyway, 
a couple years ago, we're watching, and it was David and David. I don't know, you guys remember this? David and David, and they were just fantastic. And we've got this box, like a TiVo box, it's a Rogers box, it's an electronic VCR. So you hit the button, records the whole show, and the finale of American Idol, it's just a two hour commercial. That's all it is. To get to the final 60 seconds, where they reveal the winner. We've watched loyally all year long, every episode, to find the winner. So we record it, we go out, we come back, and we zip, zip, zip to the end, and we're watching the finale. And at that moment, we learn something fascinating about how our digital VCR works. <laughs> Did you know that your digital VCR, the clock on your PVR, does not always line up with the clock from the American television station? So here's how our recording the finale goes after loyally watching every episode. Here's how it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of American Idol is David! <laughs> no! <laughs> and I'm stomping around angry, pretending stupid fox. To which my wife says, that's not what your motivational book says to me. <laughs> I'm like, you do not quote me my book right now. <laughs> but even I get bent out of shape, okay? But here's what we need to understand. We want to move as quickly as possible through the neutral zone. Do you understand that some people are better at moving through the neutral zone than others? Do you guys understand that? Some people are just better at managing change. How many have experienced this? And a lot of it has to do with your change personality. I mean, some people absolutely love change. I call them visionaries. They love change. They don't even care if it's good. They just care if it's new. I mean, you can see them anytime some new technology rolls out. They just line up with their tents and their Coleman stoves for a day in front of Best Buy. Anytime. I mean, these guys, a couple years ago, they got their tents, their Coleman stoves lined up waiting for 12.01 a.m. to buy their fresh, hot off the press copy of Windows Vista. <laughs> and they ran home so excited to install. They installed it and their computer never worked again <laughs> it's great and then hey an hd dvd player oh they ran to best buy they installed it and then sony won the technology war and it went blu-ray and they took their hd dvd player and put it on the mantle in the place of honor next to their beta machine <laughs> from 78. i mean they just they don't even care if it's good they just care if it's new do not let these guys make decisions but Change agents are the people who like good ideas, but they're not going to jump on it. They're going to vet the change, make sure it's cool, and then boom, they're on it. And these make very, very good leaders. Okay? Next type of person is the majority doctor. And the majority of the population does not love change. They do not like change. They kind of grudgingly endure change. They sort of know that they're supposed to change, but they, can, we, can we change next week? Like, I'd really rather not change right now. And it's kind of funny because any time a big technology gets rolled out, like right now in Canada, we're, uh, how many of you are from the States, by the way, just so have a sense of this? Everyone's from Canada? Okay. So you guys all understand when you go to the uh, debit machine, you have to take your cards, put it in with the chips now. You're seeing that more and more. And so it's funny because this is a change that's being rolled out. And so everyone's looking at this and like, do I, do I put the chip? Do I do which one? Because the merchants are getting up to speed. Anytime technology. Well, remember about oh, 10 years ago or so, pay at the pump comes out at your gas station pump. Do you remember this? Pay at the pump. And it was hilarious because I love watching massive groups of people go through a time of change. And so the owners of the gas stations, think of it from their perspective. They're like, oh, people are going to love this. It's so convenient. You don't have to line up inside. You just get the zip, zip, and you leave. Oh, everyone's going to use this. We won't even have to have gas station attendants. Yeah. How did this work out? Here's how it would work out. No one used it. No one. The owners of the gas stations were so caught off guard that they're like, okay, they phoned the gas stations, you remember this? And they said, okay, make the outside lane pay at the pump only. And they were so caught off guard, they had people handwrite signs. Just take a piece of paper, pay at the pump only, and scotch tape it. Do you remember that? All the scotch tape signs, because they couldn't even anticipate people weren't going to do this. So here's what would happen. You'd be rushing home to pick the kids up from daycare. There'd be lines of people, and the outside is open. No one would go on the outside. They'd line up so that they could avoid pay the pump. And then one day, you'd be late for work. You're like, oh. You get there, and you see the outside lane is open. You're like, oh, great. You zip. You get out. Pay at the pump. Oh. God. Gotcha. 
You're like thinking a trap door is gonna open. <laughs> crocodiles. <laughs> You're trembling. And then nothing happens. You're like, nothing happened. And then here's what happens. The guy pays the pump, goes home. End of the day, kids, honey, comes through the door. Gather around. Daddy, paid at the pump today. <laughs> ah, yeah, I've, actually, I've got the pump mounted to the hood of my car like a moose. We're gonna put it over the mantle. Daddy paid at the pump. I mean, seriously, people are funny, right? They just can't manage this stuff. And then the final group of people is resistors, people that just don't like changing. I'm sure no one is like this at your office, but people who bitterly, viciously, venomously hate change, and they, they don't just hate it, they really share how much they hate it. You know, at the coffee machine, for anyone listening. Now, I'm sure where you work, all of those types, they've been vetted out by, you know, recruiting and, you know, weaned from the organization. Sure, of course. But maybe some of them are kicking around. Here's what you have to understand. You've got two major strategies. We're coming down the last couple minutes together. You've got two major strategies for managing change. The first strategy is take control. Control what you can. Control what you can. I had a situation in my sales days where we got bought by a really big company called Tyco. And we only had about 150, 200 staff members at this point across Canada. And Tyco had a quarter of a million employees. It is a monster, like tens of billions of dollars. It's kind of like General Electric, like they make everything. So we get bought. And I thought, ah, big deal. I'm a young guy in my 20s. And then they tell us they're going to roll out their sales software and install it on all of our computers. Now I had a problem because I'm thinking their sales software, I had seen it, it does not work for what we do. We couldn't type in orders using their software. It was not optimized for our business. And they were going to force this on us. Do you guys understand? We were commissioned salespeople. If commissioned salespeople can't type in sales orders, let me explain what happens. Commissioned salespeople who can't type in sales orders have skinny children. <laughs> That's the way it works. So I'm like, this is not good. My sales team, they're gonna die, and I'm, I'm the leader. So let me ask you this, what can I control? Do you think I could control that we are being bought by a $50 billion company? Think I could stop that from happening? No control. Do you think I could stop them from installing the software? Could I control that? No control. Here is where most human beings give up. They just roll over. They're like, ah, oh, I can't control the immediate thing in front of me, so I'm just going to give up and complain. But that's not how I like to deal with things. I like to keep looking. How can I control this? What can I do? You understand, when you ask that question, what can I control, it forces your brain to look for an answer. So I kept thinking and thinking, and a couple weeks into it, I realized, you know what I can control? I can learn the name of the guy who's installing the software on the computers. Do you think I could learn that? I could learn that. I can phone him up. So I phone him up and say, hey, listen, this is what I do. I say, I would like to be your assistant on the ground. Anything you need, because he was down in the States. Anything you need, any piece of paper, you need a fax, you need to talk to somebody. You don't phone reception, you phone me. I'll stop what I'm doing, I'll go fax it. You don't wait on hold, I'll go get the person. This guy instantly liked me. I mean, I'm now his personal best friend. So I'm running around doing this. I don't even ask him for favors for a month. Just building up the emotional bank account. And then I say, hey, listen, when you're in Toronto, let me take you out to lunch. Do you think I can invite him to lunch? I have total control. Do you how many people say yes to that sort of thing? Sure, of course, why would he say no? So I take him to lunch, I say, listen, I don't know if you're aware of this, but your computer software does not line up with our computer software. There's some little glitches and bugs, and what I'd like to volunteer to do is to actually write a report that compares the two, and maybe little suggestions for how you can add a couple of buttons and tweak it a bit to optimize it for us. Do you think I could control volunteering to do that? Could I control moving my fingers and typing the report? Can I do that? Can I hand him the report? I have total control over that. Can I make him read the report? Can I make him follow any of my suggestions? Did he? No. <laughs> he didn't do anything. I did everything I could think of, and nothing worked. And there we are. Four months later, we've been bought. Software has been installed, and I've got a very angry team. When people are angry, and when they don't know what to do, they're paralyzed, they stop selling. So I had a real, immediate, urgent problem. So there is one thing I have left that I can control. I'm not leaving my job, I'm going to stay, and I don't know how to use the software. What is the one thing I have left that I can control? Learn the software. Learn the software, and learn it with a smile. 
because I'm the leader and I set the tone and set the culture for my team. So I learn with a smile and say, I've got to get these guys trained. Fastest way to learn anything is for you to teach it to someone else. Because as you're explaining it, you hear the parts that you're missing. You go back, review it, master it, teach it again. You want to master something, teach it to someone else. So I'd get them in at lunch. I'd get them standing up explaining this button works, this button works. We'd have little contests, little family feud, Jeopardy, little quiz games. And I'd give them you know, coffee coupons, Tim Hortons, gift certificates, stuff like that. And boom, two, three, we, like, two or three weeks later, they were trained. That's what I did to manage that. Because most people just stop and say, I can't handle it. Nothing I can do. And they give up. Don't give up. Second strategy, manage your attitude. Have a positive attitude. Goes right back to being in the elevator with my wife and the third lady. The situation doesn't make you feel a certain way. The way you think about the situation makes you feel a certain way. And so understand what a positive attitude is. It is a choice to see what is good in a situation. The way that you do this, I could spend three hours on this, I'm gonna give it to you in three minutes. The way that you have a positive attitude is you ask yourself positive questions. Write that down. Ask yourself positive questions. You see, when you ask a question different from making a statement, a question forces your subconscious to look for an answer. All of you know this is true because you've all been at your desk and you thought, what is that guy's name? What is that guy's name? You can't remember their name. Four hours later, you're not even thinking about the question. You're like, his name's Bob. And the name pops up, right? Everyone's had this experience? Name pops up. Because your subconscious is looking for the answer to whatever question you ask. The problem is most of us ask really bad questions. We ask, why is this my problem to solve? How come I gotta do this? Why do I have to clean up that mess? Why do I have to work next to this person? Why do I have to serve that client? How come I have to do these hours? Why is this my paycheck? Why do I have to report to you? Why am I married to you? <laughs> That's a bad question. You should look at your spouse and say, oh, how did I get so lucky to marry you? And it's important not to say it sarcastically, like, how did I get so lucky to marry you? Okay, that, that kills it. Ask yourself, what is positive? What can I learn from this? How will this make me stronger and wiser? What's the hidden opportunity, the silver lining? What's funny about this? Why am I blessed this is happening right now? What is positive about this? Man, I was traveling down the uh, electronic highway here in Toronto, the 407, a couple years ago, driving my trusty Toyota Tercel. Man, Toyotas are invincible. It was fantastic. I had put 1,000 kilometers a week for seven years on my car. So after seven years, I had 346,000 kilometers on my odometer. 346. Think of your car. This is how much I had. It was invincible. I mean, after seven years, the only thing I had to change was the tires and the oil and the brakes. I never had to do anything with the engine. The engine was amazing. The engine was invincible. And that morning, the engine exploded. <laughs> and I don't mean it broke. I mean, boom, like a bomb. As I'm driving, whoa, you know, and pieces of engine and smoke. And, boom, 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 and I get to the side of the road. It is done. It's done. I get the hood up, smoke billowing out of it like the engine's cracked and hissing bits of engine. The only thing that would have been more cool would have been a fireball. <laughs> like a diehard movie. No! You know, but it didn't happen. But it would have been cool. You know, city TV. And... Anyway, so I'm standing there. I've got to go to a meeting. I've got to do a presentation. My engine has exploded. It's done. And I'm looking at this. I'm like, what's positive about this? <laughs> So what do you think is positive about having the engine explode on your seven-year-old car? New car, baby! That's what's positive. I'm doing this training for a plastic pipe manufacturer. I've got a guy in my audience that's the most whiny, complaining, negative, nitpicky, venomous, vacuous, hate-filled, empty, angry, bitter, backstabbing, life-sucking, black hole of hatred I've ever had the misfortune of meeting. He was something else. And I was finished with him. I had reached the point of, ah! Oh, and he's like, oh, CJ, I have something else that's bothering me that's changed at work. And I'm like, what? what? He says, well, I'm sitting at my desk doing my job, and the phone rings. I'm like, wow. How do you handle that when that happens? He's like, oh, I'm just a high-quality employee. I just reach right over. I don't even have to be asked by management. I just extend my arm and lift the phone to my ear. And I was like, hello? Yes. And I write down what they say. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And I write it down. I hang up. And it rings again. I go, hello? 
Yes, and I write down what they say, mm-hmm, uh-huh, and hang up, and it rings again. It just rings and rings. It's a ceaseless barrage of ringing. Never stops ringing. I'm sick and tired of it. So how do you handle that, Mr. Happy Person? I say, wow, Bob, you know, I can hear the frustration in your voice. I can tell you feel frustrated. I ask him, um, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, why, why are they phoning so often? He says, oh, to place orders. <laughs> You're on the order desk? You're in sales. They're phoning to buy your product. He says all the time. <laughs> they won't stop phoning to buy the product all day long. I want to buy your product. So I've, I've had enough. So how do you handle that? I'm thinking to myself, dude, get another jump. <laughs> I, s- some people are so negative. You could put them in a dark room. They would develop. <laughs> Holy mackerel. So here's the point, guys. No matter what happens to us, We have a choice. We have a choice about how we look at it, about the meaning we attach to the event. It's always a silver lining if we look hard enough. I'm going to close in a minute, but you guys have been an absolutely fantastic audience. It's always a pleasure for a speaker when an audience is as good as you. I want to close with this last story. This is back in 2006. I'm doing training for a major automotive manufacturer. I'm at their, their headquarters, and they've gone through this literally two weeks before Christmas, December 2006, and they've laid off 100 managers. Okay, just part of the way that things are going. I do my talk, and at the end, I have one of the managers come up and say, CJ, I want to thank you very much for your talk, but I want to share a story. And he says, you know, I got the pink slip a couple weeks ago, just the end of November here, that I was being laid off. you got to understand, I'm being fast-tracked to be an executive here at this company, and I'm the breadwinner. My wife's at home with our two little ones. I'm paying all the bills. I'm paying the mortgage, the kids' university, everything. I'm paying for everything. And i got to tell you that when I got the news I was being laid off, I was so heartbroken. I was so dismayed. I was so upset. I felt so betrayed. I was so scared. I could not even go into work the next day. I literally had to phone my boss and say, I'm so upset, I can't even come into the office. I took a mental day, mental day, leave day. And he says, I I couldn't stay at home. I'd just be at home depressed. I thought, I've got to do something. I've got to get out of the house, something positive. I thought, you know what, I'm going to volunteer at my little kid's school, be around the little kids, they're happy and laughing. That'll cheer me up. And so he says, I did. I volunteered, CJ. I went with the little kids, volunteered, and my little girl was there, five years old. And they were doing gym class at the indoor community pool, because it was December just before Christmas here. And my little five-year-old, she's laughing and splashing with her friends in the pool and smiling. And CJ, it was working. I was really feeling good. And then, CJ, I noticed something that I hadn't seen before. I noticed a little dark shadow floating at the bottom of the deep end of the pool. And after a moment of staring at this, I realized what I was looking at. And I jumped fully clothed in the pool and grabbed the little four-year-old girl drowning at the bottom of the pool. And I got her up there and the kids are screaming and the lifeguard ran over and they tried and tried. And they saved her. They saved her life. It's a funny thing, CJ, the way life works. You see, if you'd asked me the day that I was getting laid off, if there was anything good about it, I would have said there's nothing good. But you see, things have silver linings. If I hadn't have been laid off, I wouldn't have been at the school. I wouldn't have been standing by the poolside. I wouldn't have seen the little girl. And now there would be a family with no little girl literally days before Christmas. Thank goodness I got laid off. I got to save that little girl's life. And I'll tell you guys, we will all face tremendous challenges. We're all going to face good days and bad, tough years and great years. And the choice that we have is to find the silver lining, find the blessing, see the positive, and life becomes an incredible journey. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.